Greetings from New Jersey Institute of Technology. I'm Mike Smolin, Executive Director of the Alumni Relations Office, and I'm pleased to host our next Highlander chat. Our guest today is Robert Cohn, class of 1983, 1984, and 1987. Robert is Vice President for Global R&D and the Chief Technology Officer for Joint Replacement at Stryker Corporation. Stryker is a Fortune 500 company with more than 36,000 employees globally. Robert is also the incoming chair of the NJIT Board of Trustees and former chair of the NCE Board of Visitors. And I'm proud to say a member of the Alumni Association Board of Directors. <clears throat> Robert, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, so, Robert, I know you're really busy right now, so I want to keep this uh, relatively quick for you. There are millions of people right now, uh, if not hundreds of millions, who suddenly find themselves working from home, managing employees remotely, managing projects remotely. So you've been a senior member of the management team at Stryker for years, and you've already been doing this for a long time. Uh, I also know that you travel all over the world. You're constantly in different places, and you manage hundreds of staff in different departments. What are some of the methods that you've used to manage your people and make sure their projects are moving forward effectively? Well, it's a great question, and no one ever expected today's world to to, to be as it's become. But the the new future is um, virtual and virtual interaction, and becoming good at it and good at it quick um, means you can engage uh, people on your teams. But also, we're a global company, and and I should also say we're a healthcare company because we're a healthcare company. We also have an obligation to supply hospitals. Um, around the world that are dealing with this. We have parts of Stryker that does hospital beds and stretchers. We do disposables, we do surgical gowns. Um, so there, there's a piece of us that had to hit the ground running. Um, for my team, we're about 650, 700 people in global R&D are located around the world. We're actually in 10 different countries, um, Australia, uh, Germany, UK, the Netherlands, uh, United States, and other places. Uh, so we are, because we're a global organization, we need to stay in touch. Um, and I say, you, you know, manage, and you talked about how to, how to manage people. Um, actually, the first priority is not to manage people. The first priority is to make sure everybody's doing okay. Uh, you know, these are, these are emotional times. These are stressful times. Uh, these are times where I think the more interaction we have in leadership with our folks to let them know that we're doing good, um, their jobs are protected. Uh, we care about their families. Um, we want to balance the workload balance, right? Just because you're home doesn't mean you can't be overworked. So we are very interested and, and very concerned about um, the psyche and the mental well-being of our folks. And we do wish them um, in these trying times, you know, only the best of health. Uh, as far as managing projects, you know, some things just can't keep con continue the way they were. Uh, we in the healthcare industry have to do labs, and we do labs because we partner with surgeon physicians. We don't practice medicine. The surgeons practice medicine. So we've had to try to switch labs to be virtual labs, if you can believe that. Um, we look at feedback, and instead of going into necessarily a hospital to gain feedback, we get those, those hospital folks on board. So I have... a excellent leadership team and my leadership team is actually distributed all around the country the, around the world the very first thing we did was get together and said what do people need what do people need to hear from us what do people need for touch points how can they project manage and then how can the managers engage with their folks that they manage and in turn motivate inspire and engage people still want to feel productive even if working from home so it's not just how to reach out to people, it's the quality of the reach out. Uh, as I said, we always start off every session by how's everybody doing? And then after talking about it, we ask about the project challenges, the project progresses, and we don't treat them like they're sitting home. We actually talk to them that we're sitting across from them, whether it's the conference room in our Mawa, New Jersey office, whether it's our Amsterdam office, and we actually get engaged in conversations. One of the first things that we learned is don't make a big deal that people are working from home. It's amazing what you could do from a designer's perspective with CAD and CAM softwares. It's amazing with computer simulation, finite element analysis. Um, we can log into people around the world and people can share screens and computers. We've become very good at Microsoft Teams. We've adopted that very quickly over the last three weeks. And Microsoft Teams is really the engagement tool. We like to see people um, and we like to, to understand, uh, just like they were sitting across from us, what's the project status? Uh, what's, the, what's the deliverables over the next week or two weeks? And let's talk it through. And then let's talk about the challenges and try to help them on challenges. 
So we're keeping that going and that theme of going. So our policies and procedures that we had in place, they weren't policies and procedures just because you were sitting in an office somewhere. They're policy procedures that you can adapt at home. We're still going to make decisions. We're going to make the same decisions. We're going to make strong decisions and the right decisions, um, but we're going to keep people involved. Everyone's part of the decision-making process. And then you could expand it further. As an example, last week to 60 people, my leadership team. So the people that report to me and the people that report to my reports, that's about 60 people. We had all 60 people on um, a leadership town hall. Uh, they got to ask questions. You do it a little bit differently. Everyone can't talk at once. But with the chat and things like that, I was able to respond to questions. We're going to do that regularly. Um, later on this week, we're, I'm going to do a global town hall to about seven, 750 people. Uh, we're going to have the president of the Joint Replacement Division join me, and we're going to be reaching out regularly. Um, and last, there's no reason we can't take advantage and look at development plans of certain people. So we put together in place a series of, um, if you will, like you can call them uh, podcasts, you can call them instructional portions where We've actually asked thought leaders inside the company uh, to talk about a project. So if there's a project that maybe someone's not working on, but they know it's a priority project to Striker, we've now every Wednesday for one hour and every Thursday for one hour for the next two months, we've blocked in people's time and we will have either a different leader describe a project, sort of like a, a lunch and learn kind of thing. And then also because our customers are surgeons, uh, we've invited some surgeons who are also sitting home since elective surgeries have stopped. And we're going to have surgeons present. It gives a great opportunity for continuous learning of our teams, gives a great opportunity for them to ask questions. And we're actually going to make use of this time as actually a benefit where we didn't necessarily have time to do this before. So there are some positives. So I think between engagement, between trying to run business as usual, between strong leadership commitment, between showing that caring, between engaging, inspiring, and at the same time providing them educational opportunities to learn more, um, we're actually we're actually in a good place. I do not have to sit here and say what projects are going to suffer. I know the machine is working great, and I know everybody stepped up in a big kind of way. Well, that was uh, really excellent. Thank you very much for that. Um, real quick, so. Uh, lots of different companies are choosing lots of different technologies uh, how have you found teams working for you so teams works teams works great we were a skype organization and we had connectivity problems with skype before so we switched over to microsoft teams uh, microsoft teams allows us to do a number of different things so with microsoft teams um, i think you can get up to 250 people in on one session in in teams anything above 250 uh, we switch over to zoom um, just because of reliability with more people accessing it. But with Microsoft Teams, not only is the connectivity good, uh, but with Microsoft Teams, you can go also to the server uh, and we can go on Microsoft where we use Microsoft and we back up all our data and have our share files on there. And anyone could pull up a share file. And while everybody's looking at one another, they could be modifying spreadsheets, modifying plans, or in Microsoft Teams, there's this great feature called whiteboard where literally everybody's screens go white, everybody's got a different color of a cursor, everybody could circle things, we could do things, we could modify things. Um, I was involved yesterday um, in a PowerPoint modification, uh, half hour of trying to look at a deck of slides that we're gonna distribute, and it was great. So, so I think that works out fine. It all works off, everybody's working off of a server or a cloud, um, all working off the same file. Um, so that's worked out. that's worked out well for us. Uh, it does take a little bit of learning. That's what we found. We found some people who just use Teams for a one-on-one -on -one, um, interaction said, hey, this is great. I get to see someone. If somebody says that, they really don't understand the value proposition that Microsoft Teams offers. They're not getting the best value out of it. And in fact, you can get more productivity and be more effective in a half hour meeting if you know all the features of Microsoft Teams. So we triggered now uh, relearnings of Microsoft Teams to maximize the full benefit and, and people are now more productive, um, people are less stressed about it and it's working well. So, so we've, we've essentially have distributed that out to 30,000 plus people across all the divisions of Striker, and it really is working well. Uh, for us right now, Microsoft Teams um, by far um, was the best choice. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so Robert, healthcare, 
clearly is one of the most technologically sophisticated, but I think also one of the most challenging uh, <clears throat> fields where technology is used, particularly for things like telehealth, which is accelerating dramatically. But again, you've had a lot of experience with this over the years. Uh, as we were just discussing before, uh, you have doctors who are actually remoting in from uh, virtual labs. Uh, I know you and I have discussed previously that doctors actually are able to remote in for um, surgical equipment for testing and things like that. Uh, what are the, some of the challenges that you've run into from a technological perspective uh, in that? And how do you see the future of telehealth like that? Do you think it's accelerating? Do you think it's going to start uh, uh, slowing down as we go past this crisis? Oh, I think if, if when we come out of this crisis, there's a couple of things that are, are I think, going to be looked at as, OK, this this crisis sort of caused a reset. I think what we're going to see is this telehealth that people are getting used to and they're getting used to maybe not because they wanted to. Now they're getting used to because they have to. Do you know how many surgeons now don't go into hospitals, but they're doing follow up visits with their patients through apps on phones? Uh, for instance, a surgeon can look at somebody six weeks after a total hip replacement and they could say to that patient here, download this app and put your phone over your incision to see if the incision is swelling, to see if the incision's healed, to see if the incision had an infection. And that was never done before, but you have to follow up these patients who had surgery six weeks ago, right? So, so people are getting more accustomed to it. So in that case, there's a clinical component of, of telemedicine and the delivery of it. I can tell you, Stryker, we were anticipating uh, well into the future that when we look at the globe and we look at some of the emerging countries' priority markets, um, that are that healthcare needs to evolve and are important. Telemedicine is the answer. Uh, you can use the internet now and you get internet in places that you maybe didn't have five, 10 years ago. Once 5G and connectivity and more data sharing comes out in faster and more reliable ways, you know, just think of what the back of an ambulance can look like. That striker, we've been working on a good majority of the components that are in back of back of the ambulance, and there's going to be a point where uh, the point of care will be in the ambulance. There's a lot of people who may not need to go to hospitals in the future. It's just ambulances take patients to the hospital sometimes because there's no physician to do full diagnostics. How many patients go to the emergency room and then get released right after some tests are done? So now the thought is possibly um, have physicians and, and surgeons. Uh, be broadcast right into the back of the ambulance between things like augmented reality, between things like uh, monitors, which can get more data, um, diagnostic test kits that are right on the site of care, that will help promote telemedicine. One of the things that has not evolved on telemedicine per se is not the lack of desire, it's the technology wasn't there. Again, reliability, what testing can you do? Um, and get quick answers to that testing. And then how can you instruct paramedics and things like that? So that's on the ambulance side of it. On the surgical side of it, um, you'll, we're gonna for a long time, right? This is, this is the way this works, right? You have a physician, the physician is responsible for the patient. Physician will be in the OR, but how great would it be if a physician um, wanted to access other physicians who may have saw a similar case uh, just to get consensus maybe on how to treat a patient? That's gonna happen in a bigger way. And then probably one of the fastest um, elements of telemedicine that's going to come out of this virus is medical education. Now that people are more adapt to using their laptops, monitors, and communicating with other people through the internet, now continuous medical education and understanding new techniques, new procedures, surgeons talking to other surgeons, instead of having to fly to a big meeting, say New Orleans, San Francisco, or Orlando, now you can have more meetings virtually and surgeons can talk to surgeons, engineers can talk to surgeons about new innovations like 3D printing, robotics, um, uh, data science, uh, computer simulation. There are so many benefits that we can do and I think we can educate a larger population now more, effective, more effectively, more cost conservatively, but get information out sooner and faster and in better ways. That's a good thing. So as we evolve, maybe that accelerates the adoption of technology that improves outcomes and improves healthcare. Maybe it allows engineers now to get more feedback on certain surgical procedures and look at addressing clinical issues that we couldn't do before. And that's just on the medical side, but think about it. So I'm an R&D guy. And if you look at R&D now, possibly with great colleges like NJIT, 
Maybe I can interact with university professors more so and almost drop a university professor right into one of my meetings. Sometimes these university professors are, are so smart at an aspect of technology and we don't need necessarily, it wasn't easy for us to get access to that person. Maybe that changes things. Now maybe engineers can talk to manufacturing vendors around the world in different ways. The information sharing, that's what's gonna keep innovation alive and well. And the innovation sharing, those are the components that spark new creativity and new inventions. Access to that and access to that and accelerate will help. Telemedicine is a piece of it, but just this form of communication of, of how you do diagnostics on patients, how you treat patients, how you can look at new procedures that benefit patients, all of this, eventually you pull all of that together and you are going to improve healthcare. Yeah, that was great. Thank you for that. Um, you know, something that strikes me as you're talking, uh, the always on, the constant connectivity, uh, 5G is an example where we're sort of surrounded by this technology. Um, and particularly from your perspective as somebody who works in several time zones around the world, how do you find time to balance, if there is a balance, uh, between your working time, being productive there, and finding some personal time, some downtime? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm not sure I'm so good at it, actually. Um, if I could fix one thing, um, it would be this time zone difference. So last night we were up late here talking to um, our Sydney, Australia office. And I was, was up early this morning um, uh, talking to our Manchester, UK office. Uh, so, so there does create a challenge with your more global and with the more information and more access, you're always on, you're never off. I mean, being able to walk out of a car and not look at your cell phone to see what new messages is, has been a challenge. I think I've, I've learned, um, there's a couple things I have learned um, since, since being from home. I could easily fill up a schedule from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. at night, but now I've learned, right? I actually now stop, don't have hour meetings. Um, I have 50 minute meetings and I leave 10 minutes to get around and walk around a little bit. That's one of the things when you're working at your house, it's not like you're walking around a company from conference room to conference room or walking through a cafeteria. So I, I 50 minute sessions um, and I block off time and, and I'm adamant about it. I have my assistants and we block off time. And there are some nights where I, I just won't work and there's no reason um, unless it's an absolute emergency uh, that I need to open up this laptop on a Saturday. Um, I just won't do it. Funny, when I was working in an office and I have many different offices, I would always uh, catch up on a Saturday morning and Sunday morning emails. And, you know, the day would extend not to a five day week. It was almost like a six and a half day week. But now I'm religious about it. Um, I think balancing when you're at home where where work time is, um, uh, coordinating and actually, yes, I'm going to be there at dinner. Yes, my mind's going to be at the dinner and not thinking about everything. So right now it's an example, I'm gonna do two nights a week. Um, I'll keep working later, but the next mornings, I'm not starting the mornings at six, seven o'clock. As we slowly evolve out of that, um, I do plan on making that the, the new way I work. There, there's the, you know, life is short. Um, everything's not about a company. Uh, I get excited about what I do. I'm passionate about what I do. Uh, but I think a famous person once famous person quite famous to me once told me, you know, Robert, you never want to regret, um, you know, stop and smell the roses. And and the biggest regret that this person had is when 20 years from now, when you're a little bit older and you look back, you didn't remember you're sitting in front of this laptop for 12, 14 hours a day. You remembered all the things that you missed. And I'm going to try and take opportunity of that and, and try to minimize the miss. So Robert, on that note, uh, again, I know you're busy. I'm going to let you go. But uh, before I do, um, you're worried about things not just being about the company really struck home. Uh, you're doing amazing work. Uh, you are a, you've been a fantastic volunteer on the alumni board. Uh, I'm thrilled you're going to be joining us as chair of the board of trustees for NJIT very shortly. Um, and my best wishes to you, your family, your company, your work, and everything you do for NJIT and for the world around us. Thanks, Mike. And also, you know, credit to you and the whole NJIT administration. I think through this, it's, you know, you're talking about companies, but it's also not easy for universities, right? There's there's still learnings that have to occur to students. How the school switched over to, to virtual teaching um, and has done such a great job out of it. The compassion for uh, what's going on with the faculty, the understanding of the faculty, the understanding, the emotional impact this has everyone, you know, universities are big places too. And you got lots of people working there and lots of people, they need to feel good about what they do. And we also have an obligation, 
uh, at NJIT to our student population and to make sure they're getting an education um, that is the education that is of the quality that NJIT delivers um, and a credit to everyone from the president down at NJIT for keeping that and in top of mind and executing on that so well. Um, I'm proud to work at Stryker, but I'm equally proud to be a part of NJIT and look at the accomplishments that the school has, but the way the school has actually sort of uh, figured a way to work through this crisis, I think it's actually been remarkable. So my compliments to them and my compliments to you. So thank you, Mike. Thank you, Robert. Much appreciated as always. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is our Highlander chat. Uh, we're going to be doing many more of these over the next couple months, so please stay tuned on all of our social media channels. And if you'd like to follow up with Robert, if you have any questions for Robert, if you have any questions about NJIT, please do feel free to leave a comment on whatever channel in which you happen to be viewing this, and we'll be happy to make some connections get back to you. In the meantime, best wishes from NJIT, and have a great day.